just checked with Lenny that my standard casework, my casework pulled out before I came tonight. She said, yes, that's the usual language from our home office. That's the usual um, commentary on this particular issue. Um, and as you're all aware, this is a really big um, kind of question around who can participate in the economy of our country, who can have their family, who can uh, enjoy the wonderful things that we have in a place like London or outside London. Um, and before I was a member of parliament, I was an immigration caseworker for David Lammy 18 years ago. So I remember doing lots of um, immigration work for Turkish speakers 18 years ago. And uh, on this particular point, I'm looking forward very much to hearing Lenny, Yassar and Emma speak about their um, campaigns and their work on this important question um, about the changes to the Ankara Agreement. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Lenny to begin um, talking to us, um, and then Yassar and then Emma. And then after everybody's spoken, then we'll have our question and answer. And I've asked the speakers to be maybe 10, 12 minutes with their presentations. So, um, Lenny, over to you. Thank you, Catherine, for the introduction and for having us here. And also, thank you, Septus, for organising this event. Um, my name is Lenny Jandam, and I'm one of the directors of the Alliance of Turkish Business People. I've been living in the UK for just over 10 years now, and four and a half years ago, I set up a business here via the Ankara Agreement provide communications consultancy services for not-for-profit organisations. On the 16th of March, the Home Office made a sudden announcement closing down the route to indefinitely to remain ILR for Turkish nationals like me who are living and working in the UK via the Ankara Agreement. The announcement appeared on the Godlet UK website overnight without any prior consultation or warning and it came into force with immediate effect. It applied to the 12,000 Turkish nationals who had already set up businesses in the UK and were already within the four-year ILR route. The news came as a shock to the whole community. When I found out about it, I was only six weeks from applying for ILR. Some people lost out by only one day, sending their ILR applications on the 16th of March and receiving a three-year extension instead, while those who posted their applications on the 15th of March received ILR by sheer luck. I was shocked, upset and angry when I found that I would no longer be able to apply for ILR within a few weeks like I planned. I was shocked that something so blatantly unfair could happen in a country like the UK. I was upset that all the plans I'd made for after getting ILR would now have to be postponed indefinitely. And I was angry that after playing by the rules for the past four years, and fulfilling every single requirement the Home Office asked of me, they refused to fulfil their end of the bargain. My anger spurred me into action. Shortly after the changes were announced, I founded a Facebook group called the Ankara Agreement ILR Solidarity Network, Ankara Lashmasa ILR Bayan Shmaru, to get a group of people together to fight these changes in a strategic and coordinated way. Within days, hundreds who had been affected by the changes had joined the group. We ran a media campaign to raise awareness of the issue within Turkey and the UK. We wrote to our MPs and started connecting with other migrant groups. The Home Office announcement only said the ILR route under the Ankara Agreement was closed in effective immediately and that a new route to settlement for those already within the Ankara Agreement scheme would be announced at some point. When our MPs queried when the new scheme would be announced, they were given vague, copy-pasted answers, saying it would be in the latter half of the year. The Home Office also didn't share any details of what the new requirements of the new scheme would look like, leaving us in a state of limbo and panic, wondering whether we would be able to meet the new requirements or be pushed out of the scheme if we couldn't. We continued to campaign for the new settlement scheme to be announced as soon as possible and for existing Ankara Agreement visa holders to be exempt from any changes. However, it soon became clear that we would, have, we would have to litigate to resolve this. We each chipped in to cover the costs of getting legal advice and by May we'd sent the Home Office a letter notifying them that we would launch a judicial review if the issue wasn't resolved. 
The Home Office responded by announcing the details of the new ILR scheme with new and more onerous requirements. The residency requirement is now five years instead of four. We will have to pass English and Life in the UK tests and pay application fees of almost £2,500 per person. Most importantly, these new rules apply retrospectively to the 12,000 Turkish nationals who have already entered the Ankara Agreement Scheme, making huge life changes, taking big risks to move and set up businesses here. A family of four is now facing application fees of almost £10,000. This is a huge sum they never budgeted for. These changes are impacting our businesses, causing a great deal of anxiety and distress. What difference does having to wait one more year make, you might think? Let me give you some examples. As we all made our business plans for four years, an unexpected extension to this period means uncertainty and in some cases financial difficulty for businesses. Some of us are struggling to secure long-term nets on business premises or get business loans to extend our operations because we don't have ILR. Some of us are unable to get mortgages because we don't have ILR. Those whose children are about to start university are now facing much more expensive international fees. The uncertainty brought about by the Home Office's announcement is costing us financially as our future looks unclear and some of us are too demoralised to find new clients or even retain our existing ones. And an extra application means being left without a passport for months, unable to leave the country, even to visit dying relatives, unable to rent a house or open a bank account because we have no way of proving our identity. The new rules also bring a number of changes for dependent spouses. Dependent spouses used to be able to obtain ILR with the main applicant after residing in the UK for two years. Spouses will now have to reside in the UK for five years to be able to get ILR, and for every extension after the main applicant has received ILR, dependent spouses will have to pay a £1,033 application fee and an annual £500 health surcharge. So yes, it does make a difference in terms of time, in terms of money, and in terms of the life plans we've all made. And more importantly, why should we accept having these rules imposed on us retrospectively? If we stay silent and accept this now, what's to stop the Home Office from making other unfair changes to Ankara Agreement leases in the future? What's to stop them from targeting other migrants, making the UK an even more hostile place for immigrants to meet their migration targets? Brexit is another worry. The Ankara Agreement is an agreement between Turkey and the EU, and the UK is only party to the agreement because of, because of its membership of the EU. With the UK's departure from the EU on the horizon, we have every reason to be worried about the UK government introducing even more changes to the Ankara Agreement visa scheme, and every reason to worry that these two might be applied retrospectively. The rules of the game shouldn't be changed halfway through. Imposing these new rules on those who have already entered the scheme is not only unfair, but we believe also unlawful. That why in May, we set up the Alliance of Turkish Business People, a not-for-profit campaigning group that's run entirely by volunteers who were personally affected by what happened. We will not just sit back and accept whatever the Home Office dishes out. We hoped the Home Office would do the right thing and hold existing visa holders exempt from these changes, but unfortunately this didn't happen. So we were left with no choice but to start legal action. In September, we filed our judicial review claim and we are currently running a crowdfunding campaign to cover our legal costs. We are raising 100k, most of which is for the Home Office's costs in case we lose. We believe we have a strong case, but we have to prepare for every eventuality. We've managed to raise £60,000 so far, but we still have another £40,000 to go, and only a couple of months to raise it. So please do donate if you can, and help us spread the word about our campaign. You can find more information on your, the leaflets on your desk. Some people are unhappy with us because we've dared to challenge the status quo rather than just accept what we were given. They think we're taking a risk by launching a legal challenge. 
they say we are um, that we would make it more risky. I say we would be what would be even more risky is staying silent and leaving the door open for future further changes, especially in light of Brexit. We must not allow for such unfair challenges changes to go unchallenged, and when we do challenge them, we can win. The Home Office previously introduced similarly retrospective changes to another group of migrants under the Highly Skilled Migrants Programme, also known as HSMP. They increased the residency requirement for ILR from four years to five years, and they applied this to existing visa holders. The HSMP <coughs> migrants formed a group called the HSMP Forum. They took it to court and they won. They won back their right to apply for ILI in four years and they, their application fees were refunded in the end. As a community group formed only seven months ago and run entirely by volunteers, we are extremely proud of what we've achieved so far. Prior to the alliance of Turkish business people, the Ankara Agreement community in the UK did not have a formal body representing it and its interests. We've managed to unite into a tight-knit community and galvanize people into taking action. I hope the spirit of solidarity continues after the judicial review has concluded. We have managed to raise a significant chunk of our crowdfunding target and kickstart our legal challenge. With that in mind, I would like to thank our solicitor Yashar Gawang, our barrister Emma Dakin, our volunteers and members, and our crowdfunding donors who have made it possible for us to get this far. We couldn't have done it without you. We've come a long way, but we need to go further still. We need to raise the remaining £40,000 because we need to fight this case and we need to win. Tens of thousands of Ankara Agreement visa holders whose lives have been turned upside down depend on us winning this case. So please support our campaign and spread the word. Thank you. Uh, there was no requirement to pass a life in the UK test, 
uh, and also um, there was no requirement to reside here for five years. Um, and in March 2017, uh, the Upper Tribunal delivered its judgment in the case of Idol, which has caused uh, all these changes. And Emma will, um, um, in a minute, tell you about the problems with um, the case of Idol uh, and uh, why we are uh, challenging it. Um, but before I leave, uh, um, I hand it over to Emma to uh, talk to you about the problems with, with Idol. I want to make it clear that uh, the decision in Idol was only advisory, and this was made clear. Uh, by the judge who delivered uh, the, the judgment. It was only advisory, uh, it doesn't contain a mandatory order uh, requiring the Home Office to take any steps to introduce the rules that they have introduced uh, recently uh, and to make any policy changes which they made in uh, March. Uh, so I'll just keep it brief um, and leave it here uh, so that I can talk about I will do, and then we will have more time in questions and answer sessions. Thank you, Emma, and the now barrister. <laughs> um, okay, briefly, just to explain, the I go to case um, was actually a dependent of a business person, and you heard Lenny talk about the requirement of <coughs> that dependent to have lived in the UK for two years. Now, that is how this all came about. There was a challenge, not only in the Idojo case, but lots of other similar cases, challenging that requirement to have lived in the UK for two years, because that was not a requirement that was present within the 1973 rules. So there, that was the start of this, and it was actually nothing to do with the removal of ILR for this category of cases. Throughout the course of that litigation, the Idodo case became essentially a lead case. The Secretary of State argued, well, actually, this two-year requirement, we'll put that to one side. Our argument now is that the standstill clause doesn't apply to settlement applications at all, and that Turkish nationals don't need indefinitely to remain in order to continue their businesses, and as a result, the standstill clause, the anchor agreement, doesn't apply. And so Turkish applicants cannot rely on the rules as they were in 1973. Remarkably, uh, the judge agreed to proceed with the Idodu case on the basis that he would consider that argument to issue, uh, as Yasha has referred to, as an advisory uh, judgment to allow the Secretary of State to then consider how they would go forward. And so that is the judgment that has essentially led the Secretary of State justifying this change in um, the indefinitely to remain scenario. So it's a strange judgment in the, how it came about, but also the judge went so far as to deal with all of the business people who weren't a party to the case. It started out as the spouse of a business person and the result of that decision was he concluded that there was no right to indefinitely to remain on this basis for any business person um, under these rules. And so the, the, the reach of the decision um, was so far reaching and it never started out um, on that basis. One of the other interesting parts um, to that case is that they won. Because the Secretary of State came along to court and said, you're right, our decision is unlawful because we based it upon a policy that was based on the anchor agreement. And now we're saying that the anchor agreement shouldn't apply to this scenario, so we agree that the decision was wrong. So the Idodu family actually succeeded in their litigation and that a new decision had to be taken and they were awarded their costs for having to litigate this matter. And so I, I think a lot of... Um, Confusion has uh, been spread amongst the community as to the responsibility of that particular case in terms of the decisions that were taken, um, but it's important to know that they succeeded in their case, and so their ability to appeal that decision um, necessarily was quite limited um, because they had got what they were see seeking, a quashing of the decisions taken against them. So what's been happening since the IDOGU decision? There were many cases pending in judicial review 
at the time the Olympic decision was um, decided. And so many uh, lawyers, including myself, amended their grounds to say, we think that uh, the judge in this decision has got it wrong for all of these reasons. And I'm going to touch on the reasons that we think it's wrong in a moment. In the first place, and these cases were all issued in the upper tribunal, the appetite of the court was um, quite positive, and we got permission in many cases, accepting, although the decision had just been made, that our criticisms of that decision were arguable and that it needed to be revisited. I certainly was involved in at least two cases that were selected to be lead cases to revisit that issue. Now, perhaps for tactical reasons, the Secretary of State didn't want another case coming before the court um, on this issue. And so all of those cases were settled. Now, one important point to make about litigation is that individuals involved have to make decisions um, based on their circumstances and what is in their best interests. And so, again, a lot of these decisions have such far-reaching consequences for everybody else, but there are individuals who are at the centre of these individual cases. And so, just because a case has been earmarked as a lead case, uh, and then they're offered a settlement doesn't mean that that individual is correct to continue with the case. So many of these cases were settled because they were given what they were seeking. And you may have heard of uh, a number of different outcomes in those cases. And um, some people were granted indefinitely to remain after withdrawing their judicial reviews and it being reviewed by the Secretary of State. Uh, other individuals were granted two and a half years leave to remain uh, as a result of essentially a human rights claim or it being treated as a human rights case. And others uh, more recently have withdrawn their judicial reviews in order to apply for an extension of leave under the new category of rules that have already been touched upon. As time went on, the appetite of the upper tribunal for these arguments seemed to diminish. Uh, it's unclear uh, as to the precise reason why, um, but certainly as more and more cases come before the court, more and more judges get to hear the arguments, no doubt there will be discussion about the points. One of the issues that is important to note as well in the IDOJ decision is that it was a decision taken by the President of the Upper Tribunal, and so essentially the most senior judge at that level, trying to convince the judges below him to disagree with his decision it is not an easy feat, as you can imagine. So it became clear um, more recently that to pursue this argument in the upper tribunal um, was unlikely to succeed, and cases uh, were more continuously being refused permission. Um, and so we were aware that we were going to have to take this matter somewhere else, probably higher. But then the policy changed, as Lenny and Yasha have referred to on the 16th of March this year, and the matter became more critical because this wasn't an issue that only affected dependents of business people, but it affected business people themselves in the way that's already been set out. Now, the way that the policy was changed and withdrawn was quite unusual, unusual in and of itself. There was no consultation, there was no uh, warning, uh, and usually the Secretary of State, uh, in other aspects of domestic immigration law, will publish a warning and say we are going to close this category of uh, immigration law or immigration cases and this will happen on this date. And then there will be inevitably some people who don't qualify to apply by that date, but at least those who do know about it and can make their applications and get it in time. None of that happened in this situation. And also, the IDOJ decision uh, was published in uh, February, March time of 2017. The Secretary of State continued to apply the policy that she said was unlawful, and she was a she at the time, um, continued to apply that policy for over a year. So there seems to be this overwhelming desire now to withdraw the policy and say that it's a really a matter of public interest to do so, but continue to apply that policy for over a year. The change in the uh, policy as of the 16th of March has already um, 
has already been stated, really became the critical point, and that's when the Alliance of Turkish Business People was formed to challenge this in, in a formal and collective way. So we sent what's called a pre-action letter, putting the Secretary of State on notice that we intend to challenge the decision uh, primarily on two bases. And first of all, we said the IDOJA decision was wrong, and that was the reason for the change when the Secretary of State um, laid the new appendix ECAA, she spe or rather he, uh, specifically stated that we withdrew the ILR policy and have created this new route indefinitely to remain because the court have told us in this decision that we've been doing it wrong for all these years. So that is the clear reasoning for the change. So our first round is that the IDOJ decision was wrong. The second round is that there was a legitimate expectation, uh, that's a, a legal ground, to say that people who were in the uh, scheme under the ECAA agreement prior to 16th March 2018 knew what they were getting into. The rules had been the same for decades and they couldn't be changed. That's the character of the standstill clause that once the standstill clause applies, it's the rules as of 1973 that have to be applied. So everybody in that category knew that nothing was going to change, or at least it wasn't going to get any worse for them in the way that it has done now. Just to flesh out a little, uh, in a little more detail, the Idodu grounds, um, one of the main points that the judge seemed to be um, persuaded uh, by was that Turkish workers who have certain rights under the Ankara Agreement with a different part called Decision 180. Uh, a case had already been decided some years ago that said Turkish workers were not entitled to settlement and uh, further to the Ankara Agreement. And so the judge looked at that case and said, well, they have a standstill clause. It works in the same way as the standstill clause applies to um, Turkish business people, to self-employed people, and if they don't get settlement, then the business people shouldn't get settlement either. Now that, that's quite an attractive argument on the face of it, but what the judge failed to engage with was that the standstill clauses in those two different parts of the anchor agreement stand still different bits. And the workers' part of the standstill clause only applies to the very beginning. As soon as they have worked for 12 months, then they move into the next part of the agreement in Decision 180 called Article 6, and they derive rights to continue working in the United Kingdom, and with that comes the right of residence to allow them to carry on working. And so the standstill clause only applies, in their case, to the bit before that. So it's quite plain that that standstill clause couldn't be relied upon to provide a, a route to settlement because it's the very beginning part. Article 41.1 is the standstill clause that applies to business persons and that is not limited in the same way uh, or at all in terms of where it applies. So Article 41.1 applies to a business person's route into the uh, anchor agreement throughout. And so the, the very basic point that the judge relied upon to say, well, they don't get settlement under the Anchor Agreement and therefore the business people shouldn't get it, in my view, is fundamentally flawed. And that is one of, one of many points that we are taking, but I think that's a, a, the real root to the problem. The judge also um, considered that the Anchor Agreement was limited in its aims to purely economic aims but he was referred to a number of judgments from the European Court that made it clear that there was additional aims such as um, family reunion, social cohesion, and that the principles of the European directives on free movement were to be drawn upon um, as much as possible. And as we know, um, free movement in the EU context has been a real hot topic of late in our Brexit discussions. And um, what we know from free movement in EU law terms is that there is an increased level of integration as people become more settled and integrated in their home communities, in uh, and their adopted communities in the host country, uh, and so that leads to settlement. 
there were other points which I don't think we've got time to go into now, but that is a flavour of some of the challenges that we are proposing to move. In terms of legitimate expectation, um, the first point is there has to be a clear and unambiguous promise or assurance um, on behalf of the Secretary of State to an individual or group of individuals that they will be treated in a particular way. What we um, consider their position to be is that by combination of the policy, the rules and the individual letters that were sent to people when they were granted um, three years leave to remain under this category was that they were entitled to apply under these rules, under the 1973 rules for settlement or indefinitely leave to remain after they had um, done four years in this category. Now there didn't need or there wasn't an explicit um, part in the policy that said we won't change the policy because there was a standstill clause and so the whole reasoning was based on the fact that these rules can't be changed. The Secretary of State in the normal course of things of course can change immigration law, they can change policy but that has to be considered in all the circumstances, whether the changes that they are making are fair and proportionate and that those changes are, necessarily, are necessary in the public interest. Other than saying we are following the I don't do decision, the Secretary of State hasn't put forward any other reasons of why this decision is necessary and why it's necessarily applied to the people who were already in this route suddenly on the 16th of March. One of the issues that is likely to um, exercise the court in this case is the Secretary of State said, well, we made a mistake. We got the law wrong, and so if there was such a promise made, that promise was on a mistaken belief. Um, that is going to be an argument that we will have. Um, I don't know what the court are going to make all that yet. It was not an issue in the HSMP cases because there wasn't said to be a mistake in those cases. So although we can draw an awful lot from those, that doesn't provide the answer to everything in our circumstances. But one thing that just practically we can think about that is in distinction to some of the other mistake cases is that this mistake isn't burdening the Secretary of State with any additional costs. There have been cases in the education sphere where a promise has been made to educate a child in a particular school uh, with particular support and services until the end of their education. That promise being mistakenly made, one can readily see how that's going to cost the Secretary of State a lot of money uh, for years to come. By honouring this promise made to the Turkish community, it's not going to cost the Secretary of State anything as far as I can see, um, and we have to consider all of the circumstances, which includes um, the fact that it was implemented for a year after the I don't do decision. Uh, there was no notice given. Um, there was no forewarning to allow people to get their affairs in order. A significant uh, legal argument between the parties is also likely to be about unfairness. There's been a development in the Supreme Court um, this year about substantive unfairness and whether that is something that we can deal with in our case. I'm not going to go into the details of that now either because that would be uh, too lengthy. But in terms of where we're at in the litigation, um, the claim has been issued in the administrative court, so a different venue to where all of the other cases that I talked about earlier have been dealt with. The reason for that is that we are challenging the rules themselves, so the new appendix ECAA, we are challenging that uh, in terms of its application to these category of cases, and in order to do that you have to re issue in the High Court. Now, um, one of the consequences of that um, is that there's a pool of judges at that level of court that haven't seen as many of these cases before, so hopefully we're going to get a fresh set of eyes um, from the court on these issues. Um, the Secretary of State has responded to our claim. They intend to res uh, resist each and every ground, which is what we expected, that's fine. And um, we have replied to their defence as well. 
in terms of timing, um, we have to get permission to proceed with this case um, from a judge on the papers first. And that's likely to take in the region of four to six months from the date of issue. So hope, if we're lucky, we'll get a, a, an answer before Christmas, but it's more likely going to be in the new year. And if we get permission, then there will be a further hearing um, in court where we'll ventilate these issues in their entirety. And uh, I'll leave it there because I think I've gone over my time. I didn't consider that. <laughs>